how far would you go to make an impact in the world? This fall, 10 incredible entrepreneurs will visit our campus to tell their stories and share the steps they took to be catalysts for change. The 2021 Entrepreneur Leadership Series, the most valuable one credit class you will ever take. We have Crystal Magla with us, who's the CEO of Flying J Management, uh, which includes Maverick Country Stores, which we all know about and love here in Cache Valley. And she's been here before, and she's a phenomenal speaker and has a, a really wonderful story. So Jaron from our office will introduce her in just a minute. Uh, just a reminder that if you've registered for this as a class, uh, the one hour, it's pass fail. Uh, remember, you have to come to nine of these lectures to get that one credit. Uh, if you've had a problem, if you've been ill, if you've had a, uh, you know, a tragedy in your family, or if you're on one of the sports teams, or if you've missed, if you just contact me and let's chat about it, we want to help all of you pass the class, okay? So don't hesitate to do that. Um, next week is Tyler Tolson, who started his company when he was a student here. He was in our program, and he started his company. He's now built a multi-million dollar company called Danique, and he's a great speaker. And then two weeks from tonight, the last session is on November 17th, and it's one of our favorite nights of the year. It's our Shark Tank night. So we have just picked five companies, student-based companies here, that actually have businesses. Uh, they have, most of them have customers and cash flow and revenue, and they're going to pitch to a panel of five judges, and there will be cash awards given. And so you're, you're going to be able to witness that actual event two weeks from tonight. It's the last event of the year. So uh, you, you're welcome to bring people, bring friends if you want to come to that. So with that, we're so thrilled that Crystal agreed to come and speak, and I'm going to let Jaron introduce her right now. Welcome, everyone. We're excited to have Crystal with us tonight. Um, a little bit about Crystal is that in 1993, she started um, her very first business, the Crystal Inn, may be familiar to you. Um, she started that with her husband, Chuck, uh, and in 94, they founded the McCall Management LLC, um, which developed and managed hotels. Um, in 2009, she became the president and CEO of FJ Management, um, and, and a few of those uh, businesses underneath that are Big West Oil, Tab, and Adventure's First Stop, Maverick, right? Uh, she's a, a wonderful leader, CEO, um, entrepreneur. She's also served a lot in higher education. I had the pleasure of serving her, with her here at Utah State on the Board of Trustees. She currently serves um, on the Utah State Higher Ed as a board member there as well. Um, we love that she's an Aggie. We love that she's here with us. She enjoys nothing more than spending time with her family uh, and her children, and her son, he, uh, Drew, is with us here tonight as well. Um, so everyone, welcome Crystal Maglet. My kids always tell me I talk too loud. Um, so I'm going to tell you the story of my life. And before I get into it, I just want you to know kind of how I think about life. I believe you need to be confident in yourself, in yourself. And I think you need to work hard. I think that when you see opportunities come, even if it's not the best timing for you, you want to jump all over them. You want to leave all your options open by doing well in school and being the best person you can be. You want to make sure balance happens over a lifetime. And of course, you want to choose your life partner wisely. So I put those up front because I'm going to tell you a story. And I hope when I finish telling you the story, you'll kind of know why that's how I think about life. So I was born not far from here in Willard, Utah. How many of you know where Willard, Utah is? Of course, yay. So you might recognize this because that sign is still there. It doesn't say Maverick, but it's still there. And I lived in a trailer. I was brought home to a trailer right next to this. And my dad owned this Maverick in 1960. We'll come back and circle back to that, actually. 
So this was me and my brother and my dad and mom, and we were the perfect family, you know, like TV and sitcoms, boy, girl, mom, dad. And the biggest thing for me in life was when my dad would put us in his plane and we would fly to LA, go to Disneyland, and stay at Motel 6. I was living right from Brigham City, Utah. My first job was not with one of our family businesses because my dad wouldn't let me work at the truck stops or convenience stores, so I showed him and went to work at McDonald's. Of course, I got my best start at all at school right here. I was an Alpha Chi Omega. Do we have any Alpha Chi's? Woo! <laughs> um, I was pledge president, actually, and I loved my days here at Utah State. I was here for a couple of years, and then I went on and graduated from Pepperdine in California, and I ended up coming back, and I, I worked. You, some of you may even recognize this office building in Brigham City, Utah, which is where Flying J was headquartered. And my first job, I worked um, buying and selling propane and butane when I was 21 years old in the marketing department. And then I went on to open, we were opening truck stops across the country, and I handled the grand openings. I had a marketing degree. And that was kind of, that was fine, but I really wanted to do more, and I wanted to get out of Utah. And one day, someone told me that Doug was at Harvard and that I needed to go there. So I, uh, were you there those years? 90, 89 to 91? I was there, I, that was the first year I left. Okay, okay. So anyway, I had the very great fortune of going to Harvard Business School, which again was a very amazing um, experience. And I'm going to tell a few stories sometimes I don't tell as I give the speech. And one of them is, one really unique thing about going to Harvard in 1989 is that I was one of a class of 800 that was about 30% women. And I, coming from Utah in 19, you know, the mid-1980s, I had never been around other women, not as many anyway, who had graduated from college, who had had careers. And one of the most special parts and educational parts for me at Harvard Business School was being a woman with other women who were also striving to do things with their careers. And I think um, that had that shaped me because I was able to see what, what everyone could do, not just people I'd seen in Utah necessarily. So in October of 1992, it was a really pivotal weekend for me because I was living back east. I was finished with Harvard Business School. I had a job. And I kind of really wanted to come back to Utah or the West Coast. I didn't want to end up on the East Coast. I'm in my late 20s. And I get invited to a wedding in Calgary, Canada, of one of my Harvard Business School friends. And I say, I'm going to go. And my dad calls me. And he says, hey, I have an idea for you of how you can come back to Utah. Will you stop in Utah? And I said, of course, I'll stop on my way. I'm going to this wedding. So I went to the wedding. And at the wedding, whoops, I met my husband. So uh, I met Chuck. He was a friend of the groom. You know the story, friend of the groom, friend of the bride. Bada bing, bada bang. And a year later, we got married. That same weekend is when, we, um, when my dad said to me, hey, I want to drive you by the site in downtown Salt Lake. I would like you to come back and build a hotel if you'd like. And I knew my dad was an entrepreneur, but he was a different kind of entrepreneur, entrepreneur than some in that he would give someone else the idea, and then he would stand back and watch and hope that you would do OK. And he'd step in to support you if you needed it. But he was very hands off. And I knew that about him. And I knew he was giving me an amazing opportunity. And so I definitely took him up on it. And I came back to Salt Lake, husband in tow, which was awesome. And we started together the Crystal Inns. And our first site was in downtown Salt Lake. Um, and this was the first furnished property. Some of you might have seen them in low. Who, how many people have seen Crystal Inns? I'm sorry, I'm, making, I'm trying to keep you awake. That's why I keep asking you to raise your hand. So it's fun for me, because you guys are locals. When I give speeches and no one knows, it's not nearly as much fun. Um, so this was actually here, I shouldn't eat, in Logan. And I, I really didn't swallow, swallow a watermelon. You can see I've got, like, there's something going on. Is this groundbreaking? Drew, stand up. That's what was going on. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Drew, Drew came, he loved this so much that he came two weeks later, three weeks early, and uh, surprised us all, which is great. Um, 
This is also, I'm really embarrassing Drew now. I told him on the way here, I said, you know that hotel right there? You're going to see a picture in the slideshow of you in the box. That's the Logan Hotel. Drew in the box in the lobby of Logan Hotel. <laughs> anyway, um, I had so much fun with Drew and opening hotels. Uh, here we are at a ribbon cutting, and I have a black dress on, so you can't exactly see what's going on. We're opening another hotel, and literally the next day, Drew got a sister. And uh, so, and then we were building more hotels, and I decided to have, we had two more all at once. <laughs> so now we had four kids, and we kept uh, building hotels. We ended up with 14. We would say inconveniently located across the country because we had one in Northeast Maryland and one in California and a lot in between in Utah. And we had an amazing business and a really amazing family. And we got to do a lot of things. This is a trip we took to Africa when the kids were little. And it was a great life. I'm going to switch gears for a minute. And I'm going to talk about Flying J, which is my father's company. So my dad actually had this idea. I'll, I'll back up a little bit. So I showed you the picture of Maverick, and I said that was my dad's station, which it was. And so he had worked at Maverick, and he decided he wanted to do something different. And so he didn't want to compete with his uncle. So he went to the West Coast, California, Oregon, and Washington, and he built self-service stations. And that was a time when you had, and you guys are all so young, but people were, I'm even too young for this actually, and they'd have white coveralls and they'd come out and they'd pump gas and full service. And, and my dad was one of the pioneers with self-service. And he built that company up. He got it big enough. He said, I'm going to get trucks to provide the fuel. I'm going to buy refineries to provide the gas. And even got into drilling. So pretty soon, by the early 80s, Flying J was a fully integrated oil company with exploration and production through retail facilities. This was our first travel plaza in Ogden, Utah. It's still there today on I-15. I and when this was built in 1979, um, my dad and his executives knew that they had something. They were rated the sixth best truck stop in America, and they're on I-15 in Utah, which is not that well traveled. And there are thousands of truck stops across the country. So around that trucking industry, a lot of other businesses were built and services. And the truck stops became a lot bigger and better. And we built a network across the country. My dad, unfortunately, was uh, killed in a plane crash in 2003. And of course, I was extremely sad about that. Um, he was a great mentor. He taught me a lot of wonderful lessons. He helped me get into the Crystal Inns. But at the time, the company was being ran by another person. We had a CEO that had been there for a number of years. And he was, had done amazing things. And my dad had taught me that this gentleman was a great professional manager. And he is who had built our business. And he had done a great job. And I believe that. And I was on the board. And actually, I think the next slide kind of. So after my dad died um, from 2000, a little after 2003, we actually bought two businesses that we were plowing a lot of money and capital into that were not making money, um, which you know a lot of people do that. A lot of people invest and grow businesses, and they don't make money for a little bit. But in this case, we put a lot of money into these two um, acquisitions. And it showed we were doing amazing. We ourselves were, by 2000 up 8, up to $18.5 billion. We had 15,000 employees. And what did I do? I was a member of the board. I attended monthly management meetings where um, we had about 100, a room not smaller than this, and people would stand up and say what they did at Flying J. Um, and we had annual division reviews where we had about 12 divisions. I would go to those. I got to know sort of the management in those groups. But I didn't have any day-to-day -day responsibility at Flying J. And then in December of 2008, when oil in July was 140 and it dropped to $30. And remember, I told you we had a pipeline. We had refineries. We had um, truck stops all across the country. We were not set up in a way that we could withstand that, and we started running out of cash. And where that ended, on December 15th, I got a call. I was Christmas shopping, and I got a call. I, was at, I remember right where I was. I was buying a wakeboard 
for our kids for Christmas. And I got a call from our general counsel, and he said, at Flying J, and he said, Crystal, I was just on the phone with the bank, and they asked about who our bankruptcy counsel is. And I, there is no way, this is our family business. Like, what? Like, we, we have no issues. Like, we have great, we've never had an issue. I mean, I knew we had a little bit of a cash problem, but bankruptcy? Like, that's crazy. Like, how? But within a few days, I was actually back in New York City in what I hoped was the right attire, because I hadn't been in the business world for a while, trying to find $120 million on, you know, the week before Christmas in 2008. And some of the professors will remember that was going to be an impossible task. That wasn't going to happen. But while I was there, I was able to hire our attorneys, our PR firm, our investment bank, all the people that we were going to need to go through a very large bankruptcy. And on December 22nd, if you worked for Flying J, you came into work thinking it's right before Christmas, I only have a couple more days to work, and you were escorted into a room, and a PR firm told you your company was filing for bankruptcy that day, and it wasn't going to be very pleasant. <laughs> and those people rallied. Um, Freefall bankruptcy is when you don't prepare. So a company the size Flying J was, normally you would know for a while you were going into bankruptcy. And you would go and you would set up things and make sure your business could keep running. We didn't do any of that. So we had to manage on our own cash flow. So in other words, anything coming in, we had to pay out because no one was going to give us credit anymore, right? So Pepsi wasn't going to deliver Pepsi to the truck stops. Crude oil wasn't going to come to the refineries unless we could pay that cash that day and get it tomorrow. We hated three-day weekends. Um, anyway, so we had to learn how to survive on doing that sort of thing when we were very used to having credit. And all of those employees that year rallied, and we were able to keep everything open and running, which was extremely key to being able to be, to successfully coming out. So, so I said I went back to New York, but I, I never really quit working after that on the bankruptcy because my dad had instilled in me that if you do a deal with someone, everybody's got to be good, you've got to be loyal to your employees, you pay people back. And I knew the thing I needed to do is I needed to save our family business for our employees, for the people we owed money, and I couldn't leave that office. And within three weeks, I became CEO. And I left those four kids, as Drew would attest, kind of. I kind of did leave them for about six months, and maybe more, I don't know. But I always say, they, after I give the speech, the kids should have to give, give it to see what their perspective is. Anyway, so it was really hard. Here I am, this mom of four. I just stepped in, CEO of a company that's doing $18.5 billion in sales and has 15,000 employees. And I have all these professionals, right? I told you I hired investment bankers, and I hired um, attorneys, and they all, they all know bankruptcy. I don't know anything about bankruptcy. These people all know it. And they are just going to go forward, and they're going to get it all done. And I sort of decided I was going to take my own tack. And, and I didn't want to spend cash any faster than we had to. And we had this big company. I brought everybody together. I said, we're going to have a brainstorming session. And I want all of you to say where you know we're doing things we don't need to do. We've got to like cut our cash burn. We had a brainstorming session. And in that brainstorming session, and this is a petroleum business, so there's a lot of men in the room, right? And a guy raises his hand. Everybody's in ties, because that's what you did at Flying J in 2008. And a guy raises his hand, and he says, well, I know this is maybe not going to help us with cash, but it's going to help us all feel better. Can we take our ties off? Can we quit wearing ties to work? And I said, take your tie off right now. And even though that's a very, and there wasn't a tie in the building within like two hours. And I don't think there's been many since then, actually. And, and the reason I talk about that in this speech is that I had to build trust, and I had to know I was hearing what people said, and that was such a symbolic thing to be able to say, you know what, it's a tough time for everybody. You want to take your ties off, do it. And it, it really, um, it's a funny way, it had people become more loyal and trusting in me. The other thing I had to do is rein in all those really smart people around, around bankruptcy because they didn't have a problem making decisions on behalf of the company. And 
So we did a really simple thing. In today's world, it would have been virtual calls, but in the day, it was we had conference calls twice a week in the morning, and everybody had to get on and talk about what they were doing, and that made a huge difference in the outcome. So that Longhorn Pipeline, that was the first thing to go up on the block to be able to sell. We got a few bids. We had a bid for like $350 million, and our second bid was about 40. And I honestly didn't have a lot to do. This was in the beginning of the bankruptcy, and I had to really delegate that. But people were able to keep that high bid. And the next things I'm going to tell you about are kind of why things all kind of got pieced together and turned out well. Expiration production, we, that company was great. It wasn't losing money. It was a small expiration company. Our creditors committee, who had people who had expiration companies, wanted, said, we needed to sell this. Like, they voted to sell it. I said, OK, fine. We'll sell the expiration. And they thought they would be able to buy it for a cheap price. They had an inside track. That ended up selling for about um, three times what they thought they would have to pay for it. And it would, was on an auction on the courtroom steps that pe two people wanted it. So again, very lucky, sold that. OK, we're accumulating some cash, we're working our way out. Then. Um, I had a competitor come to me, and he'd been trying to get me to talk to him. He had a company called Pilot. His name was Jimmy Haslam. And a family business, had competed with our family. Um, he wanted to talk to me. And we'd had all kinds of different, I hadn't personally been very involved in things, but the past CEO really was very confrontational with Pilot. And so I was sort of advised, don't talk to him. But eventually, I decided I would talk to him. And, after one meeting, I could see that he could do things with our truck stop business that I wouldn't have the knowledge. He had been brought up in it. He'd lived it. He was CEO. He knew what to do. And all the things he was saying he would do with our merged company were things I know I knew we needed to do. And I knew it would be, one, in bankruptcy hard to do. And two, with my sort of lack of day-to-day -day operating experience, it wouldn't be easy. So I really believe the best home for our truck stop business would be with him. But I also had a lot in, of, I guess, pride in our family business. And so I told him I would do the deal and merge, but that I had to be able to keep as much ownership in the merged company as I could and still pay people back in the bankruptcy, all in cash. So we went to the FTC. There were months and months of sort of not fighting, but just being checked out by the FTC. We actually signed the deal in December of 2009, a year after we got into bankruptcy, but the months sort of wore on. Um, well, our Bakersfield refinery was another asset we were trying to sell. We really it had environmental issues. This is where we had put, we had put $600 million into this asset. This was one of those fatal acquisition things I talked about. $600 million in capital. We sold this for $40 million. Painful, painful. Um, but I was just glad to get rid of it and the environmental issues. <laughs> we had to close it down during the bankruptcy, so it wasn't even operating. Our North Salt Lake refinery is a crown jewel of our company, and it's called Big West. And that was sort of one of the last things, right? I'm selling all these things off, and I really wanted to keep it. So, but the creditors, of course, wanted me to sell it. We were able, and Big Bank of America had come in and um, they're the one that kind of put us in bankruptcy. I mean, they had to, but they're the one that kind of said, You're, we're not going to extend any more credit to you. And that was in December. By August, they were back like a partner banker. You build relationships like that. They were back saying, we will help you refinance the refinery. We're seeing what we're doing. We're seeing you're doing, you're going to get, you're working to get out of this, and we will help you f refinance the refinery. I think... That was amazing that they, the very people who had not had a faith in us, understood our business enough that they were back on our doorstep. So we're going along. The business is operating well. We have plenty of cash. We're putting together a contingency plan if the FTC doesn't approve the merger. But it all came together. We had to sell 26 of the truck stops. Um, we were able to finance everything. We got FTC approval. We closed on that Bakersfield sale. And 18 months later, after we'd gone into bankruptcy, we came out. And we did pay everybody back, plus interest. When I went in to doing this job, 
I thought we had about $400 million in debt. I thought it was working to raise about $400 million. In the end, we paid back 5,775 claims to kind of close to $2 billion worth of debt. Um, I'm very proud of that fact because I just worked it. I, don't know the, I didn't know that number until I had somebody figure it out to give these speeches years ago, and I, I was kind of blown away. Um, so Pilot Flying J, I mentioned that we wanted to keep as much ownership as we could. So when we came out of bankruptcy, we ended up with about 18% ownership in a much bigger company than Flying J. And I really loved our partnership with the Haslam family, and I, I was on the board, I'm still on the board, and I thought, this business is going to go on, and, and we're going to be a part of it for forever. The Haslams want to keep this business forever. And then in 2017, all of a sudden, the Haslam family comes to me, and they said, Warren Buffett wants to buy the company, and we really want you to sell your 18%, and we're going to sell down, and it's going to be a staged buy, you know, staged sell. And, and you guys, I don't know how much you know about Warren Buffett, but you know Berkshire Hathaway is an amazing company, right? Well, what that statement says, price is what you pay, value is what you get, Warren does not overpay for the assets he buys. So we ended up doing a deal with Warren Buffett, which is fine, and we made a great deal on this wonderful company, and um, I sold, let's see, 7% in 2017 in my 18, and in 2023, we will sell the rest of our Pilot Flying J shares, which was, it's been an amazing ride, and it's been a great company. But, um, so another company we ended up having was TCH. That company was a, a processing, transportation processing company. We actually ended up merging with EFS and eventually sold that company. That was great because it helped us fund a DAF, and a DAF is a donor appreciation fund, which is kind of like a foundation, which was really cool that we had a way to fund that. Big West Oil, the refinery I talked about, we still own that today. That's the one thing we financed. Um, that debt was paid off in about two years, um, and we don't have any debt in the company today, and that asset is still with us, and we, it's an amazing asset. Tab Bank, um, we still own today. It's a community bank. It's out of Ogden, Utah. It's largely function, uh, transportation types of services still today. And in 2012 is where the Maverick comes back in, because in 2012, just two years after we came out of bankruptcy, um, I was having lunch with my cousin, because my cousin's own Maverick, because actually if I go back to 1960, when I was talking about my dad, my dad's uh, father, my grandfather, and his, his brother started Maverick. And my dad's father, my grandfather, died at 47, suddenly of a heart attack. So my dad stepped in to work with his uncle on Maverick before he decided, I don't want to do this anymore, I'm going to go build Flying J. So in 2012, when my cousin and I went to lunch, he, my cousin said, I'm going to sell the company. And I said, why aren't you here to have me buy it? Because he kind of already had something figured out. And, and he thought we still had so much debt that there's no way we would be able to buy it. But the fact is, we had all these companies that we had kept were doing fantastic. We paid off all our debt. And we were able to purchase Maverick in 2012. Um, so when we came out of bankruptcy, I was used to running a fully integrated, well, I was used to being around a fully integrated oil company. And, you know, it had its strategies, we built truck stops, you know, it had a mission. And now all of a sudden, we had kind of this mixture. We had a bank, we had a credit card processing company, we had some hotels. And I, it took me a minute to kind of figure out how do we have a mission? Like, what's our mission? Where are we going from here? And I got a group of employees together, and we came up with the uh, mission, building value to last. And I wanted, I, I really envisioned that we would have a lot of companies. I wanted, I was starting to, um, to diversify, and I really, I picked three, guide, we picked three guiding principles that we felt could apply to any company we ran, even though they may have their own principles and strategies, the three that today, even today, still are very important to me in any company that we own are excellence, mutual respect, and integrity. And 
I really feel extremely strongly about those principles, and I hope that all of the people in our company live by those principles. So today, we are diversifying. Um, we've actually gotten into health services. We have a, um, a private equity group that goes out and buys companies. These are some of the small health companies that we have ownership in. We also have bought quite a few stocks in the public market over the years. We participate in a lot of private equity funds. And we also do direct and co-investments in a number of different companies. So just where have we been? And sort of just when you think about restructuring a company, and you know, Flying J had this big sales number, this big revenue number, but the net income wasn't really that great for that big of a number. And today we don't have nearly that sales number, but we do okay on the profitability, and I'm very proud of that. That's not so common in today's world necessarily. <laughs> that revenue number is always a very important top line, but it's okay. So I wanted to just say, like, one of the things that I say at the beginning of the speech is when opportunity knocks, even if it's not the right time for you, you need to take it. You need to run with it. You in the audience, in my opinion, are living in a time that is, like, unprecedented in my lifetime. Because the last year and a half has been, like, it's, it's not the same world. It's like, and there are so many, as bad as some of the things have been, there are so many opportunities right now. And I probably couldn't tell you what they are, but I just believe we are at a point that they're out there. There's lots of jobs. There's lots of entrepreneurial things. There's all kinds of new technology. And so I just kind of wanted to mention that because, and you all know it, but I just really do believe there are so many opportunities right now. It, you, are, you are completing your educations at a time that is going to be remembered for, for many, many, many years, decades. So my secret weapon, I mentioned Chuck, met him 28 years, married him 28 years ago, um, last week, two weeks ago. He's been with me at the hotels. He's CEO of Maverick today. And I could not have done what I've done if he hadn't been by my side. And uh, really appreciate, super smart guy, and definitely has my back. And this is our family, all grown up. Um, and I am super proud of them. Well, I was busy. When, when I went back to work at Flying J, which was about 60 hours a week in travel, um, I left at 8. The twins were 8. I think Lexi was 10, Drew was 13, and they, they did okay. I, I'm a, we'll have four college graduates. Our twins are seniors at Notre Dame, so I think we're going to get there. Um, and they're, I'm very proud of all of them, and they're doing amazing things. Drew is the first to come back to our, one of our family businesses. We have affordable housing, uh, and he is, it's an entrepreneurial pursuit, and he is in that group, so that's very exciting to me, too. And I think I can go through these very quickly. Be confident. Like I said, you can't, you can't, that's number one, number one. If you don't believe in yourself, there's not anything you can do in life, really. I mean, you just have got to first believe in yourself. And I, when I talk about that, there's ego. There's people who go around saying they know everything and they're so smart or I have so much money. And then there's people who just believe in themselves, and they don't have to go tell everybody. And there's a big difference. Work hard. You can't, it, nothing comes easy. I mean, maybe for some people it does, but it's like not very often. You've got to work hard, and you've got to be willing to put yourself out there. You've got to be willing to know that you might fail, and that that will be a lesson too, and that you pick yourself up, and you learn, and you go forward. That one we talked about a lot with COVID, but I never planned to build hotels. Someone knocked on my door. I never planned to take over Flying I maybe planned to take over Flying J, but not the way I did it. Um, and I had to leave. I had to just be willing to do it when the opportunity knocked at my door. And again, leave all your options open as, again, if, you don't do your, if you're not honest with people, 
If you, um, you know, if you don't treat people fairly, you don't leave your options open sometimes. If you quit a job, you know, on the wrong terms. I, I mentioned choose your life partner wisely. You know, I think when you're the age um, that many of you are, that it's sometimes hard to talk to who you're going to be with about both of your dreams. You can probably talk about how many kids you want and, and things like that, but please talk about what sort of careers you want and talk about how you make that happen together. And your generation is a lot better than my generation at that, but don't just assume because you agreed you want the same number of kids, who's going to... Who's going to raise those kids? Because what if you both want careers? And that's possible. You can do that. But you've got to talk about it. And you've got to understand if you can support each other in that way. Because it's very possible to do. And balance. People often say to me, well, how do you, you, know, how do you keep balanced? And, and I always say, you don't, I'm not balanced. Like I am so far from balanced on a day-to-day -day basis. But if I can look back when I'm 80 years old and say, I had a great career, I had a great family, and I gave back to the community. And that's kind of where I am now. I want to give back to the community. We have a large foundation. I work on a lot of boards in healthcare and education. And I, I've got to build that community piece. But when I look back at 80, if I can look at those three things in my case and say, I did all of those, but I did it across 80 years, 100 years, whatever it is, um, then I can say I balance. But on any given day, that is extremely difficult to meet that goal. And with that, I don't know how long that took, but <laughs> anyway, um, I'd love to answer questions. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Go ahead. Marketing. I got a Bachelor of Science in Marketing, yes. And then an MBA. So even though I was 29 years old when I married Chuck and he was 29, we didn't really have those discussions, right? And so it kind of just turned out that, that when these things came up, luckily we were good enough friends and partners and we did Crystal Inn together. And we didn't even know when we got married that we'd do Crystal Inn. That kind of happened to end up being that way. But by the time Flying Jake came, we had worked together. But I was. Um, when the twins were born in 2000, I kind of stepped back from Crystal Inn, and I kind of had decided I would be, to some degree, a stay-at-home mom. I still went to the Flying J board meetings, and I still had some stuff at Crystal Inn, but I didn't do anything day-to-day. -day. So it really was, to your point, like, literally from one day to the next, Chuck and I were talking, like, you know, I'm doing all this stuff, and I, we did have help, because I still worked enough that we did have help, so the kids were used to having a babysitter, and um, so... He did agree. We did have that talk on the spot. You know, I said, because I said to him, do you want to do this? And he was, he's like, I can't do this. Like, it's your family business. Like, you, you need to go do this. And I knew I needed to do it. And he definitely supported me wholeheartedly. And he did have to pick up the slack for sure. For sure. Go ahead. So you talk about seizing opportunities. What did you do to put yourself in the position of those opportunities? And how did you determine if it was worth it? You know, I think the biggest thing was education, right? I, I did not, when I graduated from college, undergrad, I didn't have, I was kind of first gen, especially on my mom's side. I don't think anybody had really even stepped into the door of a college on my mom's side. And my dad didn't finish school. And so I wasn't really raised that college education. I mean, it wasn't that people weren't supportive of it. But I thought, I'm going to go to college. And then after I was working, it was like, well, I wanted to get, this is kind of, I wanted to get out of Utah. And the best opportunity at that point, it was, I didn't know how to find a job, honestly. So it was like, someone said, you should go to Harvard Business School. And I thought, and I went back to the campus, and I fell in love, and I'm like, I really want to go here, right? And so, and I thought, this is going to be fine. I can, this will be great. It, this will not hurt me to go to Harvard Business School. So I did that. And whenever, whatever I did, whether school, 
or whatever, I always tried to do my best. Like I knew, even though when I was an undergrad, I never had aspirations to go on in my education for whatever reason, I knew I wanted to get the best grades I could, right? It wasn't like, oh, I'm never going to need, I just need a degree, I don't care. And those are the kind of things that when you play it forward and the crystal ends, my dad said, you want to do that? It's like, I, did I know how to do it? No, I had the courage to do it. I knew I had the courage, but I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Um, and when Flying J came up, I honestly think if I hadn't had the education I did, if I hadn't opened the Crystal Inn, I mean, I would have been a stay-at-home mom coming in and these creditors and attorneys who knew bankruptcy and were from Chicago and New York would have just eaten me alive probably, right? Because I wouldn't have had anything to say why I was qualified to do that. I would have just been some you know, woman who was an equity owner of the company and had no ability to be there. But no one questioned me being there because all the experience I'd had, I could point to it. Like maybe I hadn't run an $18 billion company, but I had started a successful hotel company. I had a good education. They really couldn't poke too many holes. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's just, but I didn't know any of that, right? When I, when I was sitting here at Utah State in 1983, I didn't know anything more than my hair was freezing on the walk from, you know, <laughs> while I was up to the business college. But anyway, um, and that Alpha Chi was amazing. So um, it's, it's a journey, for sure. Mm -hmm. Back there. How were you able to start Crystal How was I able to? Yeah. Um, you know, my dad, my dad really was amazing with real estate. And so he had seen this site in Salt Lake. And he, and you know, our family debt was, that's how my dad did everything. So it was like he, um, we had like a very small family partnership separate from Flying J, and it had some money in it. It was like rental properties, and we took that, and we put debt, and we built this hotel. And, you know, um, what was a little sad to me is because I got married around the same time, rumor had it like, oh, her dad gave her a hotel for a wedding. You know, no, nah, not quite. And, um, and my dad was a business partner, like whatever amount, of, my dad was very much a however amount of equity you put in, that's the ownership you have. So, you know, it was, it was interesting because he was very, very much that way. So, but that's kind of how we got our start. But definitely, I, you know, I was, I was in a fortunate situation for sure. I was fortunate that he presented that opportunity. So I had to work really hard though, blood, sweat, and tears for sure in that hotel company. Anything else? I can't see. Oh, sorry, right there. Your most stressful time, especially like during that bankrupt uh, time, how did you manage to juggle so many things on your plate? You know, I think for me, one of the things is that I, I'm a good compartmentalizer person, kind of, so I don't really worry about a lot of different things. And so I, would, I can kind of focus on whatever I need to focus on in any given time. And I just had to get, that's like those, I know it's weird, but those conference calls, that was the one time that I could have everybody there and I'm taking notes and I'm figuring out kind of what's my plan for the next three days, how do I prioritize, who's the most important to meet with. And then I just couldn't worry about some of the other stuff going on behind the scenes because I had to have the help. You know, I, I could not micromanage at all. And so I would just try to do the best I could to understand where I could make the most impact. And then I had to, and still today, and then I had to let others do their jobs too. And then all of us together ended up a successful place. It's not easy, yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of trust involved, and you don't always succeed. Drew, did we always succeed in having good child care? <laughs> you have to take, I mean, that is, it is part of the sacrifice. Like, and this will make you all cringe, I'm sure. I went to Craigslist, and I would say I want a housekeeper, driver, I want a wife, you know, whatever. I, and, and I, <laughs> that's what I really wanted. I really did. Um, anyway, just to, anyway, that's bad to say that. But, um, but I would do that in Craigslist. And then, you know, we had the ability to, we did background checks and called references. And, and 
it, you know, I, I didn't, we didn't have family here. Like, that's, that's obviously an awesome option, right? But I, I think it's one of those things that y you, you kind of have to take a chance a little bit, honestly, you know, and you have to be really watching it, like, and communicate with your kids, because they would tell me. Like, they, I knew which ones were not so hot. Like, Mom, Ann got lost today and drove us around, you know, or she was mean to us, and you, you kind of had to try to watch that. And, and, but, but, you, but I had to anyway. That's how I did it. I mean, there's all kinds of different options, but, but I think um, it's just one of those things. Like, you can't expect that you're going to be the perfect parent and have a perfect career, and there's going to be bumps, you know? But, but I think, it, it, you know, you just have to trust. I want to trust people always, and I, that's how I was when I hired my child care, and I think it was okay. But I wish I had a better answer for that one. Any? Crystal? Yes. So Maverick is such a successful company, and everyone loves the brand, and there's three of them right here in the city, across the street from each other. Can you talk about that brand, building that brand? Well, I think it's interesting when we bought Maverick. Um, we bought Maverick because we owned the refinery, Big West, and we didn't have any... Re well, we had Pilot Flying J, and we had a long-term fuel contract with Fly Pilot Flying J. When Maverick came for sale, the reason we bought Maverick really was to have a fuel outlet for our refinery. And then almost a minute, like, I didn't really even understand that Maverick, even back in 2012, 2013, they were already at Ventures First Stop, and, you know, I was still very involved at Flying J, and... So we bought it, and then I realized we bought the brand. Like, not long into it, it was just like, wow, like, this is a cultural thing. This is a brand. And we have just nurtured that. So there are 240 stores. We now have about 370. Um, I hope you've noticed we've gone back and remodeled a lot. And we, we keep trying to evolve it, you know? I mean, now our stores have pictures from the communities you're in. It's not necessarily the cartoon character. So we're trying to keep refreshing it, but not lose the very essence of what it was. But um, I do think that it, and, and we're so, we have quite a few of them here. And we just opened our first one in California last week. So it, it's interesting to see how we can take the brand. That's the true thing, right? That the true test of having that brand is what can we do in California with it, right? With one store. Or what do we do in New Mexico? We opened in New Mexico. And, and we're trying to have more, you know, at once for that reason. But... People like our brand, definitely, but it is a little bit regional. We've got to figure out how to make it so that it applies to everyone. Doug. So, uh, Crystal, could you talk a little bit about the decisions you're making about the new businesses you're going in, the elder care, the affordable housing, and how much of that is driven by your assessment of demographics and climate change? So I would say, you know, Today, being a petroleum business, um, our third generation, Drew's generation, they, we have six third generation owners of FJ management, and they're not crazy about petroleum, and yet it's, so, it's such a great business to be in. But at the same time, my goal a few years back, kind of around the time we were doing that building value last, is I thought, okay, we have this great petroleum business. We started an investment arm. We have a lot of investments. You guys saw that, public, private equity. And we need something else that we can grow to be as big in 20 years as the petroleum is today. And so we kind of went, we hired some interns, actually, and we started sort of studying trends and whatever. And we came back and said, well, aging demographics is, is going to be around forever, and we could do some businesses around that. And so we first started in assisted living, um, which played to our retail and our service, right? I'm sorry, real estate and service, because that's kind of what assisted living is. Um, it's much different than what we do, and I'm not quite sure where we'll go with that. We have about seven assisted living um, places in California. And then we, did, we kind of morphed into healthcare, because healthcare is such a big industry, and so we found a private equity firm who was doing healthcare services, and that's how we started. Um, we partnered with them, and they, they have the expertise and go and find sort of mid-early stage, not venture, but kind of growth companies in the healthcare space. And my goal for those companies is that we will sell some of them 
but we also have the opportunity to buy some if we see one that we want to scale. So I still have in my mind that Drew's generation, we can build a platform as big as a petroleum platform. Um, the interesting part about that is if, I, if my goal was like, and a three-legged stool maybe isn't the best, I now say the fourth leg is philanthropy, actually. But um, of those three legs, I mean, my goal would be that they would all be the same. The investment arm, which is very kind of liquid investments, the healthcare, and then petroleum. The funny thing is petroleum is growing so fast that it's very hard. These other businesses are so much smaller than our petroleum. And then in my thoughts, and it's very hard to act on, but I really do want to participate in how we, we help climate change. You know? And I, I think we, we have work to do in our company on that, but it's definitely something that's super important to me to take some of our resources and start contributing somehow to help that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> go ahead. That is hard to do. Um, that leader before me was very much, so my dad was really inclusive, and I mentioned in my speech that he was a very hands-off kind of leader. The leader that, I was, that was right before me was not that. He was very much, I'm the leader, you all follow me, and I, I give you really cool opportunities, but you better do it the way I want it done. And he, he wasn't very inclusive, and he wasn't very respectful. Like all the people have, for, and I don't mean to tie, he, people had to wear ties, he didn't. He was like that kind of, and I came in and I really was just like, we've got to do this together. I was very transparent. I would have meetings and I would tell people exactly what was going on. It's like, I wanted people to know, I mean, in 2008, it's not like somebody was going to leave and go find another job. I mean, some people did if they could, but I wanted people to know like exactly what was going on so they could make up their minds about what they needed to do for them. And um, one day I got off the elevator with someone, he said, after one of these meetings, and he said, Crystal, I really wish you weren't so honest. Like, I really didn't want to know that, you know? It's just funny, but that's who I am. And that's how I tried to bring people together. I just, in, including the creditors committees and stuff, right? Because I step in front of the creditors committee and I say, I have three goals. I want to pay people back. I want to keep employees, you know? It's like, and, Luckily, I think they just looked at me and thought, oh, this is so sad, you know, but over time I sold the EMP because I knew that would show that I was listening to them, you know, and I just started trying to do things that, you know, that would build people's trust and they, it, and it worked in that way culturally and today um, I think it is, it is hard to change that culture of people who are used to being told, this is what you do, this is what you do, this is what you do. And I'm a leader where I want people to come and say, I've got this idea, and I go, so I'm kind of like my dad, like, go run with it. So it's been interesting to try to make that transition. Of course, we're a long way out of it now, so we're largely through having a culture that's much more, um, pe people feel they have a voice, and I think, and, and um, creative. I mean, Maverick's a very creative company. Uh, the companies run it pretty independent. All the presidents of those companies report to me, but they have their own executive teams, and several of them have boards. So, but culture is important. It's going to be hard. That's going to be hard with virtual, I think. The culture piece, really hard. Anyone else? I can see the lights. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. Oh, wow. This is for you. Oh, thank you. That's so nice. Awesome. Thank you. Let's give it up one more time for Crystal. Thanks for being here, everyone. And I know next week is registration. So we will be doing Entrepreneurial Leadership Series next semester as well. We would love to have you sign up again and come in and hear these speakers. Thank you.